deep in the Chin Hills of northern Burma, British, Chinese, and American troops are fighting to reopen the supply routes to China. They are fighting the Japanese, but also disease, hot days and frozen nights, and through a long period of each year, the flooding rain. Side by side, the machinery of the West and the labor of the East. The road was cut from the mountains, and with the rain, the mountains piled back onto the roads. But after weeks of labor, another section of the long route is cleared. Through the hills under the glaring sun, on mule pack, on men's shoulders, and in trucks, the supplies go on over the top of the world and through to the embattled allies. Here's some bits of Yankee ingenuity, the little tricks that help to keep an army moving even under the worst conditions. No more blowouts for these soldiers, no precious hours lost changing tires. For they have an electromagnetic road sweeper that picks up nails, shrapnel, and other odd bits of metal. Now they sweep the roads first before they use them, and the trucks ride through unscathed. Or take a lineman out from camp, and it's time for him to go home. Everyone knows that a jeep can be run on railroad tracks. But for a jeep to be its own switching station, that's something new. With the new gadget on the roof, though, anything becomes possible. First, the block. Then you take the track from the top side and put it on the bottom. You go up the track. You turn the Jeep. You go down the track. You pick up the track. All packed up and off you go. There's a quaint little gadget for getting ice off planes too. Simple if you once know how. They've tried it on the German front. Just a hose from the exhaust of a handy truck. Run the motor, and in 20 minutes, two men can de-ice a plane from prop to tail. At Lyon stood a plant run by a certain Monsieur Brillier a factory which for the past four years had been turning out trucks and motor parts for the German army. But Allied bombers blasted the walls, the factory died. Robert Lacoste, new French Minister of Industrial Production, visited the site. Foremen and technicians met inside the blasted walls to decide how most quickly they could rebuild. Workers met to allocate jobs among themselves. For the French army needed transport. French workers needed work. French industry had to be rebuilt. In spite of Monsieur Brillier, who on the day of liberation had been arrested as a collaborator. So girder by girder, brick by brick, the walls went up again. Here is the new France, girding up its loins to pull its own weight as one of the United Nations. French navies sailed the seas. French air forces scarred the skies over Germany. French troops once more stood on the Rhine. French industry, too, would play its part. Once more, the blast furnaces labored, the stoking furnaces, the trip hammers. And slowly, under this new worker management system, the Berlier factory without Berlier began to again turn out trucks. In a France, beset this first winter of freedom with great shortages of food, of heat, power, and transport, with many of its roads, bridges, and rail lines destroyed, the promise of a new birth is nevertheless being fulfilled.
Allied ring is relentlessly tightening around the Reich. As the Russians drive from the Baltic to Budapest, and on the Western Front, British and American forces move on every road to crush the Reich's counter thrusts. For the American 7th Army near Strasbourg, the fighting is fierce. follows in the wake of von Rundstedt's newest failures, as recorded by John Dorad and other daring newsreel cameramen. Again, the Allies comb the crannies for the Nazis left behind, covering the enemy withdrawal. Manned once again from the rubble comes the victims of Reich Lebensraum. As before, sympathetic Allied soldiers help them. Theirs are the faces of tragedy. This pup, abandoned by the enemy, wins a kinder master. American medical troops, abiding by the laws of the Geneva Convention, attend enemy wounded with the same care they give Allied casualties all along the Western Front. In the Ardennes, the bulge flattens under impact from three sides by American and British forces. On the prong of the attack south of La Roche, Arctic weather makes life miserable for the Tommy guarding isolated outposts. But true to British tradition, he will fight. shave, even though all be icy, except an occasional cup of tea. Pinching the bulge off, British and Americans meet at Saint-Aubert. This is an historic moment for the Allies, as northern and southern forces join here. Field Marshal Montgomery, wearing his new beret, commands the northern forces. In the south, on General Bradley's sector, the Third Army faces winter's worst blizzard. The Americans dig every inch of the way toward Upalis and Viandan. Over this road, supplies must pass, and precious mail, and the tanks rolling north to force the Germans back from Belgium. Big machines scrape the snow from battlefields once again in allied hands. Flung from the bulge, the Nazis lose heavily. At Malmedy, the battle recedes. American soldiers gently uncover their comrades. Captured here, more than 100 were massacred. Even unarmed medical troops were shot by enemy cannon and machine guns after their surrender. German prisoners apprehensively watch as the atrocity is uncovered. The toll is high for von Rundstedt. More than 120,000 Nazis captured, wounded, and killed. For Ufalese, the toll is utter ruin. This is the price of war, as von Rundstedt forces the scorching of every town from which the Nazis retreat. Here at Ufalese, the American First and Third Armies join, joined another link in the Allied circle closing in on the Reich. 